Okay. I appreciate your patience about being online again this week. This bugs that I have doesn't seem to have gone away as quickly as I thought. So I hope next week everything will be back to normal. I assume if you're here now, it means everybody got the email all right. Can people hear okay? Yeah, good. And the screen share is okay. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Welcome back. This is already lecture five of E443-543. As usual, we're gonna be talking about modeling multicellular systems and tissues. We have a lot of material to cover this uh, week. Coming from last week, there were a bunch of things that we got started on that we could continue. And as always, I need to remind you that this is being live streamed and made available for subsequent viewing. I don't know if anybody's tried looking at the YouTubes. Uh, we've been trying to edit those pretty quickly. And uh, if you have any corrections or suggestions for edits on those YouTubes, please let us know and we'll do our best to make them uh, in terms of also the documentation of them. So I'd like to sweep through the class very quickly and just get a one minute review of your project state uh, at the beginning. Then we'll continue with the exercise we had started at the very end of last class. We'll talk about tracking fields. I realized that some of these things were used in the homeworks that were officially due today. Some people asked for extensions. So if people want a little more time to do the homework that was due today, that's fine. We're going to talk about a few features at CompuCell, and then we will go over a little bit about surface energy and interaction range. Uh, that originally was a homework assignment, but I think it's not worth the uh, amount of time it takes in a homework assignment, but I do want to show you the idea about surface energy. And then we'll do a few more exercises, I hope, uh, dealing with how to control cell growth and eventually how to control cell division in cop yourself. And if we have time at the end of the class, uh, Ed is going to talk a little bit about how do you define the learning objectives for project, which I think is a little bit orthogonal to the things we've been talking about, but it's important for project preparation. So maybe we could just go around the room quickly and uh, you don't have to show any slides or, but just tell us quickly about how your projects are going. And uh, we could just start from the from the, for me, uh, Logan is the first person on the on the uh, roster. Uh, what's up, Logan? Yeah, so yeah. Um, when Nick and I were working on the assignment for this week of the initial presentations, we kind of uh, we we picked the papers we wanted to model our um, processing model off of. So. There are a few studies where they, they use total metabolic energy as like um, a constraint for like whether a cell will live, die, or divide. So we're going to in, um, incorporate that, but then we're going to combine some allelic variations from other studies. So like different cell types, meaning the different alleles, like a wild type, a cheater that's locked in like a selfish state, and then an altruist that's locked in locked in a um, producing state. And then um, we are also adding in a function for mutation probability. So like whenever the cell divides, there will be some like chance P that they will acquire like a new allele. So they'll go from wild type to cheater, wild type to altruist or any combination thereof. Um, yeah. And I, that's I, I should say, if you wanted to do a presentation, you're welcome to. I mean, if you had a slide deck you wanted to go through, that's fine. I just I just didn't want to push people if they if they didn't have that ready. Oh yeah, I mean we 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 have one ready, but we don't have to go through it if that's a constraint. Well, it's up to you. I mean, we could do it this week. We could do it next week. What's what's more comfortable for you? Um, I I'm ready to go this week if that's okay. Okay, I mean officially officially everybody was either doing the last week or this week. Uh, but again, my goal was to try to minimize stress. But if you're ready to do it, why don't we why don't we go over it and then uh, uh, 
we'll see we'll see how things go then okay go ahead i'll 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 give you the screen share and you can take it away Can everyone see that okay? Yeah, it's going to do well. All right, so like we've said before, Nick and I are working on a quorum sensing model for uh, testing quorum sensing inhibitors and how they shape population dynamics and bacterial populations. Okay, so just a quick background on some quorum sensing. So cells will constitutively excrete signaling molecules called autoinducers. Auto um, these are typically metabolic um, excretion. So like as the cell goes through its normal metabolism, they produce these signaling molecules that they excrete. Um, and the signal accumulation is directly tied to population density. So as the population of the cells grows, the concentration of that autoinducer within the solution does as well. Um, and genes are very differentially regulated at high versus low cell density. For example, um, in a, the bioluminescent bacterium, Vibrio fischeri, at low cell density, the cells are dark, they don't bioluminesce. And once the cells reach quorum, they all synchronously turn on their bioluminescence operon and begin to glow. Um, the pretty blue color. Um, and then in a lot of human pathogens like cholera and erythematicus, this regulon um, or corn sensing will regulate a, a lot of genes. And in shrimp pathogens, it's over 500. Um, and that is the case for some of the human pathogens as well. Um, and then corn sensing also regulates what's called public goods. So siderophores or iron utilization proteins. Um, as well as different virulence factors that will free nutrients if the bug is within the host. And so within quorum sensing populations, there almost always arises these things called cheaters. So subpopulations of the bacteria will evolve into QS dysfunctional states. They can be signal blind, so they just don't know that there's any quorum, or they can receive signals, um, but they don't produce the energetically expensive public goods that the wild type cells do. Um, these cheaters will typically you know, utilize the public goods that the wild type cells are producing without incurring the metabolic cost themselves. Um, so they almost always maintain a fitness advantage on the individual cell to cell level, but at the population level, wild type um, non cheater cells always win out unless um, the cheater cells greatly outnumber the wild type cells. Um, and then how these deviants impact form sensing based drugs, infection, and the overall fitness of the population as a whole. Um, is really underexplored and undercharacterized. So that's kind of what our goal is with this model. So a model from um, PLOS CompBio uh, connects signal production to the uh, growth, uh, connects signal production to growth and um, in order to simulate public goods. Uh, another model from PLOS One uses stochastic mutation of three alleles to measure diverse populations. So like I was mentioning, they connect um, mutation to a quorum sensing allele, and it allows the population to shift with time as the cells divide. And then, um, as you can see on the left here, or I'm sorry, the right here, there are in vivo experiments on how cheating impacts the evolution of quorum sensing regulated uh, cooperation. So this is kind of like a control for us to make sure our model is working. I've, or, um, I am collaborating with the professor that was responsible for producing this figure. Um, he get, he's given me some raw data so that after we have our model up and running, we're able to compare it um, and make sure it's applicable to what we see in vivo. This is just um, like the dark here is a cooperator or wild type strain and the gray is a cheater. And these are different media conditions and different inoculum cohorts and how they shape are shaped over time. Um, and you can see that in most of the scenarios, wild type cells at the end make up nearly all or most of the population. It's only in minimal media where cheater cells are uh, the majority at the beginning, down here in the corner, that cheater cells uh, went out because of the higher metabolic cost incurred by the wild type cells. And I'll kind of, um, I'm going to go over like, what our goal is. So we want to model how quorum sensing heterogeneous populations evolve over time based on inoculum cohort and how the presence of quorum sensing inhibitors might alter this. So this is important because quorum sensing cheaters 
um, are immune to quorum sensing inhibitors. Um, and depending on how they evolve, they can also still remain virulent even without quorum sensing. So if they decouple their virulence from quorum sensing, that can become a problem. Um, and no one has really modeled how this happens because the typical trope is that quorum sensing is evolution or quorum sensing drugs are evolution proof, um, which me and a lot of other people within the field disagree with. Um, so this, these experiments are kind of helping to characterize um, how populations will evolve when exposed to these drugs. So the impact of this is um, since they're being developed as antibiotic alternatives, it's important for us to understand how quorum sensing inhibitors impact bacterial populations. It also provides insights on how inoculum cohorts for a given infection might impact the effectiveness of quorum sensing treatments. Um, and this could be generalizable to other forms of treatments as well. So that's exciting. And then it also provides insights. Sorry, I can't see that. It provides insights um, to the evolutionary dynamics of altruism versus selfishness and prokaryotic populations. And then we're going to do this by capitulating known in vivo data in Cell 3D using ODEs um, from the LK study, which was the FOSS prop bio. Um, and that's just kind of serving as our scaffolding for the math behind the model. And then we'll utilize the allylic structure from the FOSS1 model um, in order to kind of set up our different uh, populations and help define our inoculum cohorts. And then uh, we'll add in drug field, drug fields based on the data from my lab and measure um, changes to the population dynamics. So now I'll kind of jump into the, like the architecture of our model. Um, we only have like one type of cell quote unquote, and it's bacteria, but there are three primary alleles. There's the wild type, which is the default, cheaters, which are a lock S state, which I'll get into what that means here in a second, and then altruists, which have a lock capital S state. Um, and I'll kind of walk through the different things we've defined so far. So there's the sensor, which is sensing whether or not the autoinducer is at a quorum concentration. And that can be active or capital S or inactive, lowercase s, ligand, which is the underserved uh, producing um, enzyme, can be active or inactive. Um, and then allele changes, so changes from wild type to cheater to altruist, are driven by mutation probability every 10 um, MCS. And each cell has a defined metabolic energy with a set decay rate to simulate metabolism as the cells grow. Um, the decay rate is influenced by the SNL states. So capital L or active ligand producing states incur a greater metabolic cost compared to lowercase l. Um, so this one thing I didn't mention earlier that the while the autoinducers are constitutively expressed, they ramp up expression as the cell population grows. So that's why we have the difference in states here. Um, and then S incurs a metabolic cost, um, regardless of if there's neighbor density with active S states and it's a higher metabolic cost than the L, capital L state. Um, and so like, that's just to get on, um, of course, you must be turned on to produce benefits and it's measured like with the autoinducer field. So this change from um, lowercase S to capital S is driven by the, a chemical field of autoinducers. And then quorum sensing will have a reward or an R function on the metabolic energy decay that is dependent on the intake of the product field. So in this case, like a common good um, will be produced as well on top of the um, autoinducers and that common good field will be produced relative to whether or not the sensor is active or not. And QS positive neighbors will support each other. So this was pulled from another study that comes out of um, an ecology journal where some quorum sensing populations will evolve to favor other quorum sensing cells over cheater cells. So this like quorum sensing positive or active S neighbors will support each other will be a toggleable feature on our model where we can see, okay, if our populations are favoring being near other quorum sensing cells, as some studies have shown, um, the population will order like this. And if we take that um, benefit so to speak, away, like how does that change? And is that applicable to what we see in the in vivo data? Um, cheaters also benefit from having quorum sensing neighbors nearby, but that's a product of the um, product field only. So that uh, PF chemical field is the only benefit they're receiving from having active quorum sensing neighbors. 
Um, and so, like I said, the, S, the capital estate will produce a benefit on the K only if estate uh, capital estate neighbors are present. So it doesn't matter um, if it's capital S, it only gets the um, neighbor benefit if the S neighbors are there. And then the cells will grow. Um, and then every 10 um, Monte Carlo steps, they'll either divide if their metabolic energy is greater than a given value or they'll die if it equals zero. And then again, that brings in the mutation probability as well if they're dividing. And then we have four different fields. So we'll have an autoinducer field, which is produced based on the uh, L state. So it's low at a lowercase L, high at a capital L. Uh, the product field will be secreted based on the S state. Um, and it increases the metabolic energy gain from the nutrient source. So we also modeling a nutrient source field, um, which will allow us to like see how either pinprick nutrient sources or just like a general um, nutrient media will change how these populations are modeled. Um, and the increase of the metabolic energy by the nutrient field is uh, affected by a multiplier. So like, the product field will affect how much increase in metabolic energy is derived from the nutrient source, um, as well as whether or not there are corn sensing neighbors nearby and if we have an effect on that. Um, and then finally, we'll have the corn sensing inhibitor field, which creates a multiplier that decreases the impact of the S state on the reward until it forces a lowercase S state at a value based on the IC50 and MIC data from my lab on the specific drug we have. But um, these two fields will be changeable. So like if someone else is coming in with a different corn sensing inhibitor, they will be able to change these fields and model how their drug is impacting their, their given population results. And so we expect that this result, our, our model will put out two primary outputs, a quantitative and qualitative output. So we'll have plots describing the population size of each allele over time. Um, just, plus describing the number of active S states over time, plus describing the number of active L states over time, the overall virulence or um, product field of a population. So how much quorum sensing products are being produced by the population at any given time and the average uh, metabolic energy for each of the allele. And then qualitatively, we'll be able to look at the spatial structure of allelic populations and how that shifts over time, um, how the nutrient field is structured based on these allelic populations, um, and then how the drug influences this stru these structures and how um, the virulence is spread by the population as well. That's, that's all we have to say. So, so I guess there are a couple of things I didn't catch, but maybe I should let people in the audience ask questions first. Um, looks like, so has, so are there published spatial models about this? You said it was an OD model that you were basing your, your primary work off of. Yeah, so the ODEs, those are just describing, um, that is pulled from the PLOS comp bio study. And they, they like set up their model and like um, mock microfluidics devices. Um, so the, architecture we're putting into that is so like if you want to create like a structured initial inoculum you can do that as well and like if you want to add um yeah structure to the actual initial inoculum if you don't if you care about how the populations are organized at the very beginning that's something that you can and so one one question then so so how are you doing cell cell growth for example does the does the resting metabolism depend on the volume of the cell or does the, the rate of production of the public good or metabolites depend on cell volume? Or, you, or is there going to be some other set of assumptions on that? Um, there's going to be some other set of assumptions on that. So um, one thing we've thought about is like constraining cell volume. So rather than having them divide every 10 MCS, just having them divide at a specific volume. Um, uh, but because there's typically like a max expression level in vivo for these genes, uh, those will just be like on the gradient of on to off. Um, just because most quorum sensing genes, like while they're regulated on a spectrum, they are either turned on or off. There's not a whole lot of in between them for most of the products. So I guess the, the, the rate of, if the gene is on, then the rate mm -hmm. of production of the protein is going to depend on how many 
how many copies of the messenger RNA you have and how many ribosomes you have. And in a naive way, you might expect that to go linearly with the volume, with the cytoplasmic volume of the cell. Uh, it might not scale that way, but it, but you know, some things there might really only be one copy per cell, independent of the cell volume. In other cases, as the cell got bigger, you'd certainly expect that it would use more energy if it was a little bigger, maybe not linearly. Um, those are second order things. I mean, you can always add them later, but, but mm -hmm. that's. I mean, the only other question is you you did a great presentation, Nick. You didn't you didn't say anything. And so I guess one question for me just about the project is, how are you planning on dividing up the workload and the tasks for this project between the two of you? Nick, do you want to take that question? Yeah, yeah, sure. I was ready to talk. Uh, we made this presentation together, but Logan definitely did a good job with the biology. Um, I think I have a stronger programming background than Logan. So when it comes to actually uh, considering some of the, the computational implementations of the way we're going to do the cell processes, I think, where, where my expertise comes in a little bit. Um, I, I also wanted to mention the, the idea of relating the metabolic energy to the growth rate. Um, we were talking about doing a constant growth rate as long as the metabolic energy was above a, a certain threshold, but I, I do think having those be related to the cell volume is probably a good idea. Um, but yeah, just as far as uh, the programming implementation, I think we'll, I'll take, and then Logan, obviously handling the biolog biological portion. Um, and then- and That's fine. I just, I just, I, just, I mean, it, it's fine. You, you, you have to decide how you divvy things up. I just was trying to understand what the plan was for the... Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you're fine. Uh, the last, um, the other question you asked about the previous models, I believe one of the two, um, this milk model or Cicerone, um was a lattice-based model, mm -hmm. but I don't think it was in copy um, Okay, so that makes it closer then to the, yeah. so we should probably try to meet and, and go through those papers together, either, either the next couple of days, I'm sort of torn up, tied up because there are a bunch of people coming down from Purdue to get ready for an NSF site visit, and I have to host them. So, so my my the rest of my week is going to be a little can, tied up. But maybe you could sit down, Giuliano or Hayden. You could sit down and look at the at look at the the those modeling papers. Maybe you've already done that. Just walk through them, and and think a little bit. I mean, you've already laid out very nicely what the fields are, what the cell types are, what the what the phenotypes are. Um, but but looking at the models, the modeling papers in a little more detail to ask the question: Is there anything in those modeling papers that might be hard to implement in CompuCell, uh, or or vice versa, or not? Um, I mean, always, would, we haven't talked about how to do diffusion yet. We're, we we haven't gotten to diffusion fields. They're not that hard to do in CompuCell. Uh, but uh, it does take a little bit of work. Um, and Trump yourself, probably in this particular situation, um, the fact that cells, the, the bacteria have rigid cell walls won't really matter. You know, the detailed shape of the bacteria isn't going to be that critical for this model. Um, on the other hand, spatial clustering is, you might imagine you get clusters of collaborating cells with a few cheaters mixed in. If you had a clump of cheaters, they do poorly. Uh, if you have a clump of, of all cooperating cells, there's an opportunity for a cheater or two to get in and exploit that dish. And so you might expect spatially localized dishes to occur. Um, and, uh, and the lot's going to depend that on the diffusion length of your nutrient, uh, your, your public good, and your, and your quorum sensing molecule. Probably the quorum sensing molecules, because they're small, diffuse pretty fast pretty far, uh, whereas some of the, they, the, the sideriforms are probably less or bigger, and so they probably don't diffuse as far. Uh, those kind of things about ratios of diffusion lengths may be important to the patterning and, and the selection you see. Um, that was one thought I had. Um, 
the other thing when you talked about, which is it, it gets hard to because there's so many options for it. But you bet should look at, at a case where you have a uniformly available nutrient, sort of a cell culture case, mm -hmm. at a case where you have uh, a spatially varied nutrient, it might be more like a real world situation. Uh, but, but one thing that becomes quite interesting in these evolutionary systems is when there's temporally variable nutrient. And so, the problem with temporally variable nutrients is there's just an awful lot of ways to make things vary in space and time. It's hard enough to make them just vary in space, but making them vary in space and time, you can't do every possible pattern of variation. Uh, but uh, in a lot of in a lot of evolutionary systems, temporal variability, uh, spatial variability, there, there's a sort of a truism that that when there's a gradient of a, of a scarce resource those regions of gradient are the places that drive evolution. Because if you're in a position where you have high level of whatever you need, you don't, you're not under evolutionary pressure. If you're in a region where you have very low level, you die no matter what you do. Whereas in the gradient region, you start out here, and if you happen to do a little bit better, you could move further into this dish that's not explored. Um, and so, there's some nice papers by people like Tom Cho at, at uh, UCLA doing uh, uh, analytics on what are called first passage time problems in this area. And uh, so those, there, again, you mentioned that there's some, some evolutionary theory that may not be right. Uh, I don't know whether the, the belief that gradients drive evolution is always right. Uh, it's credible, but this is a situation where you might be able to test that a temporal variability also, um, the classic example, I maybe already have gone over this, but but it, it it's it's a strong art, it's it's probably the main reason that you get metastasis in cancer is is not spatially variable nutrient. So when you have an avascular tumor spheroid, you have nutrient on the surface and not in the center. And when I say nutrient, whatever the limited resource is, it could be oxygen, it could be growth factor, it could be glucose. And so in that case, cells that stay on the surface win. And you could do that easily enough by down-regulating cell-cell adhesion, up-regulating cell matrix adhesion. But that doesn't make the cells intrinsically migrate out of the tumor into the outside world. If you then add temporal changes in nutrient availability. So here, the nutrients here, now, here, now, here, now. Then uh, you could create situations in which uh, it's beneficial to not only be at the surface, but move around. Um, and so that, that's a possibility. Here, you're not talking about mot motility of the cells, uh, but the cheater, non-cheater dynamic might be relevant. And I don't know if this particular bacterial species that you're thinking about are motile or not, um, but that that question of temporal availability can be pretty. I would I would kick yourself. In other words, if you don't get to it, that's fine. But it's interesting to ask it in the back of your mind if 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 nutrient availability in the environment would be temporally variable. And the example I would give you for why this is interesting if 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 nutrient availability cycles over a period of seconds and you're a cancer cell, you just stay in one place because you wait for the nutrient to come back. If the nutrient availability is in big blocks and the changes are very, very slow, then you're stuck. If you find yourself in a dead zone, you have no way of swimming out of it in time. You're going to die. And so in that case, buffering is better. Moving doesn't do you any good. You can think about this as example. This would be a school of fish in the ocean. Um, if there's a, a set of liquid, of, of, of ocean water that comes in that's high in nutrient density with plankton, if, if that moves too fast, the fish school can't follow it. And all the fish can do is survive and wait until there's more nutrient. On the other hand, if the, if the nutrient 
a bubble moves at a rate where the fish could swim at that rate, then they can follow it and do better. And so uh, if, these th if the changes are very fast, they don't do anything evolutionarily. If the changes are very slow, they don't do anything evolutionary. And then you have the same kind of thing you get with a spatial gradient with temporal gradients. And so um, I don't know realistically if you get that far in this, in, you know, in this semester, but as a question to ask, if you're doing microfluidics, you could, you could do temporal and spatial gradients of microfluidics. In fact, we have a patent from many years ago uh, on devices to build good microfluidic spatial and temporal gradients. Uh, that's something we used to do in my lab. Uh, and so uh, it was something we worked on a long time ago as it happened. So hearing you talking about that uh, is rather interesting to me. And, and so then, and then computationally implementing this efficiently is, is going to be for, for Nick. Uh, you're probably going to have to get this up on big red or one of the on, on carbonite. Because when you're going, to be, you're going to be doing evolutionary studies, you're going to have to run a lot of replicas. And so maybe one thing you could do to get ahead would be to look at how to run on, on clusters. Uh, Giuliano knows how to do it. We won't cover it probably in class because it, it's a lot of it's not a lot of work, but it's a little more than we could probably do in the lectures. Uh, but Giuliano can probably help you with that. But I would get started on that now because it's not trivial. Uh, I actually do have um, experience using the IU HPCs. So, so that's that. that's great. Um, the question is always getting the right packages installed on the particular cluster you're using. And, you know, is it slurm? Is it something else for data wrangling and all those yeah. things? So Giuliano's pretty experienced. Uh, yeah, yeah, we probably have more experience with the HPC generically, but in terms of the issues of specifically running CompuCell, uh, Giuliano, do you have any comments on that? I'm finding the um, our COVID scripts because CompuCell does have some parameter scan built in, but it's not the best. But we made some some other ones for COVID that I think are better. So I'm searching for the the scripts and I'll paste them in chat in a second. Man, that was for Carbonate, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, and I recently ran stuff there too. So great. So that's something you could you could you could work on. Yep. And that would be talking about a a, 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 a a public good that may be expensive to develop. In the context of this, Nick, if you get good at running on a particular cluster, I'm sure your classmates would love to to learn how to do it. So. Uh, if you want to give people a bitty a bitty workshop a bitty lesson or two on how to do how to use IUHPC resources, I'm sure uh, everyone in the class would probably be better for it. Okay. I definitely wouldn't call myself an expert, but I'm sure with Juliana's help, we could figure it out. Okay. Anything else on, on any other comments, questions? Uh, Hayden, do you have anything you want to bring up? Uh, no, not this time, I don't think. Well, thank you. That was good. And uh, it's a great project, and I'm glad the two of you are working together on it. Okay, I guess that we should keep going. Uh, Gabriel, you already presented a fair amount. Is there anything you want to present today or update on? Yeah, no, uh, not really. Uh, it's just the controller is in Compu, so I've got it working. Uh, now it's just got to hook it up to sensors and do that part of it and the evolution part. But first, first phase is done. Um, something I might do and Giuliano, I might poke you sometime about this is I've got the same the uh, neural network class in C++ that I showed you before. And uh, I, I wanted to, I, if I, if I optimize it, I might try and Put C++, but but that's probably something I would truly and I'll eventually poke poke you about if I need help with that. Yeah, but it's yeah, been no, a that's while it. since I built <laughs> CC3D from scratch, and I think things changed quite a bit. But happy to help, or at least try to. 
Right? Yeah. So maybe maybe Giuliano, you could hook him up with Machek or TJ. Yeah, I think that would um, be faster. Were, were you thinking about doing a, a, a um, our, our, our a Python wrap, or were you actually trying to do the direct integration of the C plus plus? Were you going to swig? <laughs> were you going to swig your C plus plus, or were you going to use it raw? Um, that's a good, that's a good question. I don't know. I was <laughs> using it raw. So funny. I, uh, yeah, I was thinking of maybe just throwing it in there. I, I don't really know what the back end of CompuSpell looks like, so I'd probably have to wait and see. But uh, yeah, they're they're both possible. Um, yeah, uh, it's not. If if you wanted if you wanted to really release if you ever were thinking you actually might want to you know as a paper or something release the your your C plus plus code as a as a part of the CompuCell release, mm -hmm. then probably you need to swig it so that it's controllable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then uh, I then I'd wrap uh, it. And, yeah. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're if you're going to do it just for your own project, then then it may be less work. Uh, for a one-time thing to, to 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 do a hard code integration, but that's something I I would I would Juliana could you could you help Gabriel just talk to TJ and about check about these issues? Yep. Um, because uh, it it's exciting if you could do that. It's something we, would be great to have. Um, and again, um, I will be the first person to say that uh, that that's outside of my competence level. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, I know but, the, the 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 hard the the back end C plus plus code I understand well. The front end I know. Uh, the integration code uh, is not is not something that I I'm an expert in, and so so we have to I have to we have to send you to, to the experts. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, I posted in a link to the plugins directory of CompuCell's GitHub. You can take a look at some of those there. See how oh, the cool. back end looks. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, yeah there thank actually, you so much. There actually is, um, even in Twitter, mm -hmm. we never show it, but there is, in fact, uh, a, a uh, create CC3D CC module. Yeah, for C. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, so, and that will template in a lot of the, of the boilerplate code you need to be able to interconnect. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But as far as the project goes, as a proof of concept, the, yeah, the neural network works great, slow, because it's in Python, but good. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty neat. Okay. All right. Let's see. Elmer. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I can even do my video i guess so i don't see it. so our group we have started to work on the presentation and taking the yeah working on the presentation and we took the biology apart and as well the hypothesis that we have and we looked into how they implemented everything and we have not yet looked into the specifics how we transfer this over to CC3D. So I think it would be better when we have the presentation next week for that reason. Then we have the, the, the full presentation, but if you want the could show what we already have, but I don't know if this is worth the time when we next time present. Right. That's fine. I mean, you know, if, if everybody presents a full presentation in a class, then, then the whole class is that, which is not a bad thing. But in a sense, if people, if we have each week one person presents a serious presentation, one group presents a serious presentation, that's sort of a nice balance in terms of lecture versus your 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 contribution. So if you feel more comfortable uh, for next week, um, that's fine. I think next week is better because I would as well prefer to look. We, there are two papers that are related to the to this machine learning part that they have, and I would like to understand them a little bit more. I mean, I, I, I pulled the paper and I skimmed over them, but I would as well like to really understand them deeper. So, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Now, let's see. Who are you? 
Let's see, who's next? I have to remember who's in which group now. I'll learn that eventually, but it'll take you a minute. So if I call on somebody who've already spoken, then don't worry about just say that. So hey, Hayden. And Ibrahim. And uh, Carmen and Mike are also in our group. Carmen and Mike, okay. We have a so, presentation. Yeah, we can yeah, pull that So up. far, we've uh, chosen the paper, the one by Alexandria Volkening. And we're going to be meeting, I think, to try to decide when we can meet with her. Um, and what we've done so far is Carmen and I worked on the uh, the proposal paper. And Mike and Ibrahim have the presentation. I think it's ready to go. Okay, if you want to go, if you want to present it today, that's fine. Everybody, take it away. Then I'm delighted. Uh, it's it's really great that Alexandria is willing to help out. Uh, nothing better than having the person who wrote it available to answer questions. And she's a really nice person. So uh, that was our thought too. <laughs> All right, I guess I can start if everyone's ready. Um, so our, our project idea is modeling zebrafish stripe formation, and we are looking specifically at a paper entitled Modeling Stripe Formation in Zebrafish, an Agent-Based Approach. And maybe just a little background um, about zebrafish stripes in general is that they're typically comprised of three pigment types. One is called melanophores, those are black. There are xanthophores, which are yellow. And there, then there are iridophores, which are silver. And the, I guess, the orientation of these um, different pigment cell types are iridophores are typically on like a lower layer, and they help with the orientation of the xanthophores and melanophores, which actually make up the um, the stripe patterns. Um, and then what's interesting is, I guess, what inspired this paper is the interaction between each of these pigment types that help to dictate um, the actual stripe pattern formation. So first, what they wanted to do, I think might be useful just to go through all the figures kind of of the paper. Um, what they wanted to do for this one is they wanted to check long range interactions between different pigment types. So what they did was they took zebrafish stripes, they ablated certain regions of them and ablation, I guess for anyone who doesn't know is just they removed certain portions of the pigment area. Um, and they did this, I believe, just through ways they, they subjected those regions to high powered lasers and they removed the pigments basically is what happened. And I guess if we look at um, A, they took a typical two, like a yellow stripe, black stripe, yellow stripe pattern. They ablated a small square region of the black and they waited for 14 days to see what types of pigments and which orient and which arrangement would um, return. And what they noticed is that if you just take the square of the black the black middle stripe, the after 14 days the black stripe starts to reform. The the black pigments melanophores start to reform in that um, ablated region. However, if you I don't know if you can see my cursor. Are you able to see my cursor in this as well? Okay. But if you remove not just the central black region, but also the xanthophore regions adjacent to the, um, the black square stripe you remove, you actually get less melanophore reintroduction. Um, and then in C and D, they just tried different patterns. And as you can see the in the control, I kind of control, not really control, but um, when you just remove the black, um, you get high reintroduction of the melanophores. However, if you remove adjacent xanthophores in various configurations, you get decreased melanophore reintroduction. And this kind of indicates that um, the development of the melanophores at a long range is positively affected by um, xanthophores, not technically adjacent because they technically classify this as long range interactions um, because short range interaction are just immediately next to each other. So this is technically a long range interaction. Basically at a long range, sorry, melanophores need xanthophores to exist. 
Um, and then they tried a similar experiment in the opposite direction, as in there's a black stripe, then a yellow stripe, then a black stripe, and they ablated the central square of the yellow stripe region. And what they noticed is if they just did that, then um, yellow pigment reforms after 14 days, the xanthophores reform, which is all good. But then if they removed the adjacent melanophores, I know this might be a little confusing with the terminology. I still get confused melanophores and xanthophores myself. Uh, so I might be saying them wrong. So I might just switch to yellow and black because it might be easier for me to remember. But um, if you remove the melanophores adjacent to the xanthophores, instead of getting xanthophores, the yellow stripe back, you actually start getting melanophores inside the region that you're supposed to have the, um, the xanthophores. So here you can see there's slight black pigmentation when instead it should be yellow pigmentation. And this is even more egregious in this example when they almost entirely removed the melanophore stripes. And then you see actually high concentrations of melanophore development in the supposed to be xanthophore region. And then this is also just depicted numerically with this graph as in when it's just the removal of the xanthophores, there's low melanophores, which is what we want because we want actually xanthophores to be there. Um, but when we start removing more and more of the adjacent melanophores, we start getting higher concentrations of melanophores in the supposed to be xanthophore regions. And they said that this indicates that um, melanophores in neighboring regions of stripes actually um, repress the development of other melanophores at long distance. So the existence of melanophores at a long range also inhibits the development of melanophores at a long range. And that's, I guess, evident in this model because if we remove the inhibitor, which is the long range melanophores, we start getting melanophores. Meaning that because the repressive element is gone, we start seeing the um, the activation of that type of that phenotype. So that was the first interaction they found at long range xanthophores activate melanophores and melanophores repress other melanophores at long range. So that's the first interaction. The second thing that they wanted to do was trying to kind of see their dependence on each other for existence at long range. So once again, they took um, these like alternating stripe patterns. First, they started with black, yellow, black, and they removed um, the, the black stripes. And what they noticed after three days, the yellow stripe is still totally intact. Everything looks good there. But then when they did the same thing the other way around in a yellow, black, yellow stripe, and they removed the yellow stripes, what they noticed was the black melanophores actually started dying out. So the concentration of melanophores started deteriorating when there's no long range adjacent um, xanthophores. And this kind of indicate that at a long range, um, long range xanthophores are required for melanophores to exist. That was the, the conclusion that came from this. So that's another long range interaction they discovered, or they, uh, I guess, are proposing. So now they wanted to test the um, the close range interactions. So what they did was they took a look at developing zebrafish at young baby zebrafish. And what's important to note about young zebrafish is that in their yellow xanthophore stripes, they still have melanophores because they those melanophores, as they develop, what's gonna happen to them is they're either gonna migrate to the black stripes or they're gonna die off. Um, and we can see that in this I guess an F, the control, basically what happens is they took a look at all the these isolated melanophores in this xanthophore stripe. And um, as time progresses, all of the, the isolated melanophores either migrate to one of the bands at the top or the bottom, or they die out. So that's what was typically expected. So what they did for their experiment was they ablated the region near the isolated melanophores um, uh, 
yeah, they ablated the region near the adjacent, near the isolated melanophores, meaning that now these melanophores are no longer adjacent to xanthophores, and they took track of these isolated melanophores to see what would happen in these instances. Um, and what they noticed was no longer would they ever die out. There was no instances of dying and the migration count increased. And actually there were still some remaining melanophores in the um, xanthophore region. And they said that these results suggest that um, the elimination of melanophores um, in the control experiment was caused by directly by the xanthophore surrounding those melanophores, which means that the xanthophores inhibit at close range the development and existence of other melanophores. So at close range, xanthophores inhibit melanophores. So they did a similar experiment here, kind of the other way around, and they just, I guess, to breeze through this one, um, they found a similar interaction the other way around, and they found that um, xanthophores sorry, melanophores inhibit xanthophores at close range as well. So with all of these, um, with all these results, they compiled this, um, this graphic of their proposed um, interaction mechanism. And what they propose is, um, like we said, from the most recent experiment is at close range, as in just adjacencies, both xanthophores and melanophores inhibit each other at close range. Um, however, at long range, xanthophores uh, promote melanophores and actually are required for the survival of melanophores. And at long range, melanophores inhibit themselves. So they took all of these findings, developed a simulation model, and they applied initial patterns to the simulation model that matched zebrafish that they had. And they wanted to see if their simulation model developed the same zebrafish patterning as the in vivo models that they actually just have. And what they found was very similar patterning as in this initial pattern developed this stable pattern, which we can see in the adult zebrafish here. Same with this patterning their simulation indicates that this should be the, the final adult pattern, which we do see here. And then here's another example. We see just three more stripes as well. Oops, I, oh, sorry, okay. And then here as well, a more interesting initial pattern results in this stable pattern, which we also see in the zebrafish. So this is very interesting, meaning that their simulation model very accurately um, correlates or corroborates real life data. So the way they did this simulation is they did this with a substance secretion model. And they did this, uh, basically the way they did this is melanophores released um, a short range substance that, that they secreted. And that short range substance inhibited the growth of xanthophores and mildly inhibited the growth of melanophores uh, so basically this, this MS substance mimics this short range inhibition behavior. Um, and then they also, xanthophores, they had released a short range substance called XS that inhibits the, the, the production of melanophores, which represents this inhibition at short range. And then also they had xanthophores release a long range um, substance that is required for the survival of melanophores. So that is this, um, that is this interaction that we see here. Um, so basically with these three substances that are secreted, we kind of get this type of simulation. Um, and that is why they were, I guess in the paper, they were so proud of how these three substance modeling can so accurately uh, recreate real life zebrafish patterning. So that's what the model is, I guess, so far. So I guess what we as the project are trying to do are perhaps either trying to recreate this in CompuCell, which would be the initial goal, 
and then perhaps trying to advance upon this in a few ways. One way is to add iridophores. And iridophores, if you remember from the beginning, were the silvery um, kind of base pigments that are there for the zebrafish. Um, and those iridophores do have interactions with both melanophores and xanthophores in kind of a 3D space um, that hasn't been actually modeled yet in any simulation, at least that we've seen so far. They have been um, documented. There's another paper that I read that details the interactions between um, iridophores and melanophores in different contexts. So if these interactions perhaps could be modeled in CompuCell as well, we could advance upon the original model. Another advancement we could do is um, introduce other chemicals or environmental impacts that we know have effects on certain um, uh, pigment types, as in specifically xanthophores or specifically melanophores, if we know a chemical that specifically inhibits or modifies or adjusts either melanophores or xanthophores, we can introduce that to the simulation and see the outcome. So those are the advancements I guess we are trying to propose in our project if we can get the initial, I guess, simulation up and running in CompuCell. So that is our project idea and that is the paper. Um, are there any questions? I guess the simulation you showed looked like it was a PDE simulation, but I think there was, she also had a paper which had an agent-based model of the cells. Or maybe it was the same paper. It was the 2015 this, paper. Yeah, I believe so. So this simulation, um, they, the, the description of the simulation is in some supplemental materials that I have to read right. through. So I, I was under the impression that I guess this simulation that was in the supplemental materials was this simulation that they proposed in figure four. Right, but, but there, one of the things that we face, which we haven't really talked about so much, we've talked about a little bit when we compare uh, physicel and copyrcel is that you could have the same underlying biology described by that picture at the top, which represents interactions of the cells. And you could implement it in different ways. And you, it, and you could implement these uh, fields as essentially a density field of cells, which would make the cells a field rather than objects, agents. Um, and then you could write a, a set of partial differential equations that could have six or you have three fields here for the for the concentrations and then you'd have two fields for the density of the two cell types um, and that would be essentially saying that the cells are basically small enough that you could treat them as continuous um, another way would be more like copy cell or physical cell where the cells are really object phys physical agents that move around and do things and and i think she's done simulations of both kinds and ultimately, the, the, the basic results should be the same in both representations. Um, but I, I remember a picture, at least in, in one of the papers that I sent of hers, I think the 2015, whether it was the PNAS or I don't remember whether it was published in PNAS or somewhere else now, um, that, um, that, that uh, had the individual cells moving around. And and so, it, again, we should probably sit down and look at it together, look at the papers together and just sort of walk through what the issues would be in terms of adopting it uh, to, to CompuCell. Even the pure PD one, you could do it CompuCell. It is over, CompuCell would support that. Um, uh, you would maybe, you might not be taking advantage of, uh, of CompuCell as much, uh, but it's nothing wrong with it. It should be quite interesting to do a pure PD model and then the same model where you've substituted cells for the field. Leano, I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I I think those are good ideas. And um, one thing that I was thinking was that you could, since the 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 activation is short range, if you do use CompuCell cells as agents, you wouldn't need to even have a diffusing field for it. I mean, just assuming that the range of the chemical is like just the next cell over. But then there's the inhibition. So I don't know. I'd have to think a little bit. 
but we we could look at how she did it and, and of yep. course she's available to ask um which is great i think i think it's a nice this kind of, of sort of gyra meinhardt type patterning is is really very pretty and uh and something that that it can be a lot of fun tuning it winds up sometimes tuning these is a little tricky you have to get the 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 dis, the the fusion lengths are pretty critical for these things. But uh, if she's already done it, you know what the values are. So then it's it's easy. Um, so I think this is, is pretty neat. The idea of, of doing the iridophores um, is another reason we need the two and a half D compute cell. Uh, um, compute cell in principle, that's you certainly you could do the full 3D model. Uh, Compu cell also in principle lets you do what we call two and a half D model, where you have two, two, two D models that are on top of each other, and and that's something where we could we've been meaning for a long time to add a little bit more uh, support, making that a little bit easier. Um, the advantage of that that two 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 sheets of one D sheets on top of each other rather than a full three D model is is just that the the simulation time it runs a lot faster. Uh, so a lot of the uh, immune response models we did were two and a half D. We have a layer of cells in the, of, that represent the, say, the lining of the lungs, and then a layer of cells that represent the immune cells moving on top of them. Uh, and you don't you don't model either one in three D, but you have two two distinct layers. And so if the if the spatial organization of the iridophores um, is like that, um, that that would be achievable. But I think this is all pretty. This looks looks interesting. Did the other people in the group have anything they want to add at this point about the the project? Again, sort of. You talked a little bit about how you're divvying it up. If there's any more you want to to lay out, I think it's a it's a there's a lot to do here. It's a, it's got a lot of potential. It also, could be great a good great educational exercise. In other words, be able to replicate some of these. Ablate these cells at these places. Change this diffusion length. There are a lot of educational things you could do here, uh, in terms of exploring development. I've always thought it would be really nice to take sort of the images in Gilbert's developmental biology book and turn them into simulations that you could put online. And this would be really doing some of that. This, these are sort of classic, classic developmental biology problems. That would be great to have in an educational uh, as well as research uh, modeling framework. Um, I don't have anything else to add right now. Yeah, we haven't discussed further any divvying up of the work yet. <laughs> so I would I would say urgently, at least one or two of you need to look at the models in a little bit more detail and say the we just saw that in the previous talk where it said these are the the cell types these are the fields these are what they're doing uh try to do that you talked a little bit about you know inhibition inhibition could be having the cells move away or dying or replicate or the activation could be replication or some or attracting cells uh, trying to make tables of those kinds of behaviors so you could say this is these are the features, these are the processes and interactions that you need the cells to, to have. Um, and then see how those are controlled in, in the uh, original papers. But I think, I think uh, there's a, and again, you're gonna need diffusion here, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, uh, so people may have to do some breathing ahead in the copy cell lectures or manuals uh, to learn how to do diffusion and uptake and secretion. It's not too hard, but it, but, and we'll cover it in class, but you may want to get, you want to may read ahead so that you don't have to wait for us to get to it in class. Um, and then we can come back to it. Okay, great. Other comments or questions about that? That's good. Uh, let's see, JH. I'm in the team with Elma. Okay, so you're working with Elmer. So are things going okay for you? To, uh, 
you didn't say anything before, so I just want to make sure if you have anything specific you wanted to uh, to bring up. Mm, not specifically. I I can show some preview of our presentation, but I can say before or later. Either if you have something you want to show, or now is a good opportunity. I don't mean. Again, I didn't mean to prevent people from showing things. I just didn't want to put <laughs> pressure on you if you if you weren't ready. That's all. No problem. So, so can I? Uh, can you stop sharing the screen so that I can share? So our project uh, is based on this paper um, and we're gonna present next week about its biological context, hypothesis, and how it dealt with Morpheus model and how to translate it into CC3D. So, um, hmm. Yeah, I, I guess, um, yeah, we are just preparing for this and we, we can present as a whole team next week, I guess. I, I think it would be better. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm it looks like you've got a lot of material to present, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm pleased to see people people forging ahead. Um, obviously, the more the more the the more you could do early in the semester, the the better. Uh, but I also understand that that it takes time to develop these ideas, so um, don't. So um, if you want to want to present next week, that's fine. All right. Okay. okay. Did I miss Did I miss anybody? I think we went through everybody. If I missed somebody, please speak up. I don't mean to. I don't mean to be excluding people. All right. Well, thank you again. That was great to see people's ideas, and. Uh, People seem to be moving ahead very, very effectively. And uh, I'm glad to glad that that's going well. Again, my availability the next couple of days is going to be iffy. Uh, Giuliano is always around. Hayden is around. Um, definitely do our best to connect you with other people. Uh, Joel, who has not been really part of this class, but is in my group and is an experienced CompuCell user, um, I'm sure would also be happy to give some advice uh, if there are things about modeling development and signaling that you, you need help with. So, so please do reach out. Don't be shy about saying you want to go over the papers together or discuss model structure, any of these things. Okay. So coming back to what we did last time, we had talked about uh, Python steppables, and I realized that <coughs> the CompuCell changes, and the slides don't always change. And so, um, one of the things that was added to relatively recent versions of CompuCell is something called an on-stop uh, function, which is called when you hit the stop button on player. And very often when the when the simulation ends, uh, you want to do the same thing, whether it ends by running out of Monte Carlo steps or by having somebody actively stop it. Uh, and so you might uh, call uh, the finish function from the on stop function or the stop on stop function from the finish function. But the problem with the old system 
with just finish was finish was called when you ran out of Monte Carlo steps. But if you actively stopped the simulation, you didn't call it. And so if you use the finish function to write out the results of the simulation and you stopped it in player, you didn't get them written out. And so that's a, a bit of an addition. The key things again are to remember that start is called, so start is init is called at the before the beginning of a simulation. And when you're using some things in the init, you need to remember to put them after this rather mysterious steppable base pi dot init line or bad things happen. Uh, the start function is called essentially once the simulation is configured once step function is called periodically through the simulation is where you put most of the things that you're going to do uh, as the simulation runs uh, finish is typically used uh, for saving parameters for saving saving images saving results or or possibly uh, if you want to be able to say restart the file re restart the simulation saving configurations for a restart And then we talked a little bit about how to use Twitit uh, to make your life easier. These uh, CC3DML um, code snippets and the Python code snippets. Not everything is there, especially newer things. Occasionally there's a typo. If you find a typo, let us know so we can fix it. Find something missing, let us know so we can fix it. Uh, but the idea here is to try to minimize the amount of memorization you have to do for common functions. You don't remember how to type uh, the name of the uh, volume constraint. You can look it up under cell attributes. You don't remember how to iterate over all cells of a given type or all voxels in a lattice. You go to visit and so on. The biggest problem is that there are too many menu items. And so it really is, as I say, worth just opening each one of these one at a time and sort of seeing what's in it. Uh, and a few of them may not be obvious by name, so they're the way their name may not be clear. Uh, in that case, uh, you probably don't need it, uh, but sometimes it's it's useful to have. So, so that, that Twitit uh, editor is quite helpful. Now, if you're using something like Visual Studio uh, or some of the GitHub editors, um, then you don't get these features. Um, and uh, if you're very experienced with CompuCell and you know all the code, then probably that's fine. But I think for learning, the the the, uh, the uh, Twitter editor features are pretty helpful. And again, on this long list of Python ones, I'd say cell attributes, extra fields, scientific plots, secretion uptake, and visit or once you use pretty often. Something that we talked about just a little bit, but I wanted to come back to um, is that every cell in a simulation of CompuCell has to have a cell type. And uh, those types are listed in the XML. And You'll see there's a type ID 012, and you'll see in some of our old simulations that we'll still reference cell types by number. But really, that's not a very appealing way of doing things. Um, and so you could reference cell types inside of Python by their name. Um, but a little bit confusingly, the type IDs are given in all caps. So if the type name was dark, all lowercase, the type name uh, in the Python would be D-A-R-K, all uppercase. I think that that would means that you cannot have two type names that are distinguished by the case. You couldn't have D-A-R-K, lowercase, and D-A-R-K with a capital D being separate cell types. I think that would break. I'm not exactly sure how it would break, but it would be a bad idea. So I don't recommend doing that. Um, you might want to be able to get the um, information about the cell type 
Um, cells as they have as an attribute, cell.type, uh, that will return the numerical value 0, 1, 2. And so if you want to know its name, there's a function get type name by cell, not very elegant. Uh, or you could simply look it up um, um, as well. Some of this, some of this slight awkwardness is because the the manipulation of cell types by name was something that was added later. Originally, types were numbers back in the days when CompuSol was Fortran code and uh, the pre-Python CompuSol. And so uh, there's a little bit of a of a legacy of, uh, which makes that slightly inconvenient. Uh, we talked about this issue of specifying things in XML, which essentially makes things either global to all cells or global to all cells of a given type. And then uh, situations in which we want to be able to edit and control cells individually. In particular, we very often want to control cell volume or cell surface area individually. Um, and we don't really have the ability to combine those. Uh, what you have to do if you want to have uh, change the type the volumes cell by cell you have to tell the xml to use the volume plugin but not give it any spe detailed specification or the surface plugin not give it the, any detailed specification and then in the start function you have to define initial values if you fail to do it in the start function the cells will disappear because those those values will be set to zero Uh, but it can be a little bit confusing if you build a simulation where the volumes are set in the XML and then you write some Python on top of that, you forget to get rid of the volume specification by cell type, then the Python won't throw an error, but it won't do anything. It should probably throw an error when you have an inconsistent specification. So uh, I have a question no, for naming. There is always this... Um lambda for the actual cell size or actual cell volume why is this always lambda where is this coming from so so remember that you cannot specify the actual volume of the cell that's something that emerges from the properties of the cell and the cell's environment so again if you think about a balloon if I put a given amount of gas in a balloon, then in, in, each, in a particular situation, the balloon will have some volume. If I compress the balloon for the same amount of gas, the balloon will get smaller. If I put the balloon in an environment which is at lower pressure, the balloon will get bigger. And so you can think about target volume as being the amount of gas in the cell, so to speak, the amount of mass in the cell. And lambda volume would be equivalent of the com inverse compressibility. The bigger lambda volume is, the closer the actual volume will be to its target. So, so can I see like this that the target volume is the cell without compression, or is this wrong? You mean um, what? You mean when is the target volume equal to the actual volume? No, I mean, <laughs> that if I give a target volume, and this would be when there is zero pro compression, when when there is no resistance, that's what the target volume will be. But as the alpha always make, I mean, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll actually do an exercise on this in a few minutes. So it's a good, okay. it's a good question. But 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 you're right in the sense that um, the difference between the the the, the, the pressure in the cell is two times lambda volume times the difference between the actual volume and the target volume. So if the actual volume and target volume are equal, the pressure in the cell is zero. So think about, I, I wish I had a, I should have a rubber band, I have rubber bands. Nobody uses rubber bands anymore. But a rubber band is okay. Here's a I don't know if you can see me, but here's a rubber band. 
If I don't pull on the rubber band, it has some equilibrium length. So that equilibrium length would be target length. If I pull on the rubber band, it gets longer. So the actual length is longer than its target length. But the rubber band is pulling back. It's exerting a force, a tension force, to pull it back. And that tension force is proportional to the spring constant of the rubber band, which would be equivalent to our lambda. Now, in the case of a rubber band, if I try to push on it, there is no compression modulus, so it doesn't behave under compression the way it would under tension. Uh, our volume and surface constraints behave symmetrically, more like a metal spring, which I can compress or extend. Uh, so the rubber band only works in tension, doesn't work in compression. But does that help at all? Yes, that helps. Um, I understand that with alpha is the kind of the spring constant. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank and you. so, I mean, technically, the, 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 the lambda volume would correspond to the Young's modulus of the material for for uh, for the surface um, it looks like the looks like the spring constant of the material uh, if i have a rubber sheet and i pull on it then the the extents the the the, the spring constant of the of the sheet is what lambda lambda surface would be. And I, I understand that using using these uh, using these uh, targets is it takes a little bit of getting used to, but this idea of constraints, elastic constraints, is a very general one, and and they're hiding in physics cell. They're just really hidden. They're there and specifically implemented in the form of the potentials, the form of the interaction potentials, uh, but they're a little bit harder to back out in the center model than they are in the systems that we're doing but they're, they're there in the same they're there in the same way they're just hidden a little bit we had as well the young model in maria doll blossoms class so yeah. now i can connect the things that's, that's good yeah thank you sure. and and again we'll we'll do a little bit of an i hope we'll, in a few minutes we'll do a little bit of an exercise on that i wanted to do it at the end of last class and we ran out of time so let's try we'll do that together and i hope that'll clarify them and don't be shy about this. Norm in, in older in, in previous years, I had quite a bit of material on trying to under and explaining how these how these uh, constraints worked. And and uh, in the interest of time, I've taken a lot of that out of the lectures. Um, and so it's certainly possible to put them back in or to add some slides on that topic. So I want to just come back now to some programming. Uh, critical thing in CompuCell is dictionaries. Again, if you're Pythonic, uh, dictionaries are familiar. The key thing is that every cell comes with a dictionary, and that's the place to store information that is cell local. And the great thing about that is that it's available anywhere in the simulation, uh, and in particular for tracking fields. It's available to make tracking fields automatically for display, which is probably the single nicest thing CompuCell has. Uh, there's also a global dictionary, which has the rather unattractive name of shared steppable variables, V-A-R-S, um, instead of something like self.dict, which would be uh, maybe more natural. Uh, if the cell has something called dict, you'd hope that Self would have something with the same name, but it does. So you have to remember that if you want to use the global dictionary, it has the name shared underscore steppable underscore VARS. Could you create something named self.dict and just make it equivalent to shared steppable VARS? Yes, but it's. I don't think it's a good idea to have dict as a variable name. I would guess that would be a problem, but I just I just wondered. At least you could give it a you could do some kind of a shorter name that would allow you to. But in any case, that's the thing. And as as uh, as Gabriel's pointed out, the things you attach to a dictionary entry could be something quite complicated, like an entire class with functions as well as 
parameters and variables in it. The one thing that you cannot attach a dictionary to, to as a dictionary um, entry in general is a cell object. So you do not want to say cell.dict quote list of cells equals and then cell. That will cause a problem. Um, and I think that's because of the way SWIG works because because any 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 native python object you should be able to attach to a dictionary but but for some reason the cell object you don't want to attach to a dictionary if you're going to be stacking cells you want to stack cell.id or something like that not cell itself that's a bit of a, a bit of an advanced annoyance but, but i think and it won't maybe it won't make sense until you do it by accident but i promise you uh, as you develop these sophisticated simulations you're working on, somebody will do that and you'll get some strange errors. And so then maybe maybe at that point, you'll remember that there was a little warning about it. All right. We talked about plotting. CompuCell is pretty good at plotting. Again, to do a plot, you need to do three things. First, you need to create a plot window. And you have a variety of things you could do at the plot window, like making the axes linear, logarithmic, having grids, labeling the, labeling the X and Y, having a legend, and so on. Uh, some of those things can be overwritten in, in player with a right click, although not all of those right click functions work. And then once you have a plot window, you have to add a data series to that plot window. You can have more than one per plot window. You could have multiple plot windows as well. And for the data series, the primary things you're going to be doing are defining whether it's lines or dots, the color, and how big the, the line or the, the, the dot is. I don't know if you can change the, the symbol when you're using uh, symbols. Probably you can. I don't remember the whole list of possibilities. After you've done that, in the step function, typically, you're going to add data points to those data series. And you have to re remember what the handle of the window is. Here it's called plot win, but if you have multiple plot windows, you'd have to replace that with the appropriate reference to the window. And then you have to remember what the data series name is. And you'll notice it's in quotations because it actually looks like a dictionary key. Um, and then, x comma y and those x and y are often time comma value but it could be two any any two uh, floating point numbers uh, there's also an option for clearing plots which you can look up in the in the twitter uh, code snippets um, one thing that you'll find when you do things this way where you keep adding points to plots is that if you have really a lot of points and you keep updating it, uh, redrawing the plot can actually take quite a bit of time. And so if you put 100,000 data points into a plot and you redraw it every Monte Carlo step, that will slow your simulation down quite a bit. And so then you might want to either think about erasing the plot at some point or uh, reducing the number of data points that you put up or reducing the frequency with which you update the plot. It's not it's not wrong to do it all the time at high frequency, but it, it can be it can be slow. The, the actual graphical rendering of the plots can be slow. Okay. We talked about iterators, uh, CompuCell. Typically, the iterators that we're going to be using a lot are iterating over all the cells, uh, iterating over cells by type. If we want to count how many cells of a given type there are, we can look at the length of self.cell list by type. That will tell us how many cells there are of that type. There are also iterators for all the neighbors of a cell. And that neighbor iterator is a little bit funny because it returns a, it returns a pair of objects. It returns the identity of the neighboring cell and also the contact area. And something that's a little bit 
unusual in the way Python works is that in a lot of languages on the left-hand side of an equal sign, you can only have one thing. In Python, you can have x comma y equals seven comma eight. And that's legal. So you could do multiple assignment. And so the iterator for neighbors has multiple assignments. So that takes a little bit of, of getting used to. Uh, we'll see that a little bit later. We're not going to do that right. One thing that you do have to be a little bit careful about in Python, normally it will fail gracefully, but it doesn't always, is that when you're iterating over a list, as in for cell and self dot cell list, you are not supposed to modify the components of that list during iteration. So if you're going to do for cell and self dot cell list, and then you're going to create or destroy cells, the list of cells will change. And that can cause problems. And actually, I'm just thinking, I wrote a simulation where I did something which I shouldn't have done that way uh, uh, recently. A lot of times you're okay, but you can have strange errors if you try to iterate over a list that, that changes. In particular, if you add cells, uh, typically the self.cell list gets captured when you do the iterator declaration, and so you won't iterate over the new cells. Somebody says, uh, you put a print statement in my code, and I can't figure where they find where the print statement shows up. Um, are you on NanoHub or are you on your desktop install? Local. So this is a, this is another annoyance. Uh, the the prints will print to the console, to the Python console. It would be nice if they displayed to the console window in player. And in player settings, there's a button that says display prints to the console window in player. It doesn't work. Um, and there is a workaround for that, which I will show you in a few minutes. If you are on NanoHub, you are stuck. You cannot print on NanoHub. Which reminds me, Giuliano, again, we really need to get the newest version of CompuCell up on NanoHub because some of these annoyances are, are lifted in that. Okay. Other questions about that? All right. So let's start out uh, by going back. Uh, if you have the code you worked on last, last uh last week that would be good otherwise you could just create a set something very quickly um create a simulation uh initially where you have a single cell and the cell has a volume energy and a surface energy and specify the volume and the surface in Python, so you'll use just volume slash and, and surface slash in the XML. Uh, create a plot window to plot the volume in the surface of the cell. And then uh, we're going to add plots of the pressure and the membrane tension. And remember, thinking about our rubber band, the pressure of the tension is equivalent to how hard this rubber band is pulling back on my fingers. If the length of the rubber band is equal to its target length, there's no tension. If the length is bigger than its target length, there's a tension, which is proportional to the difference between the actual and the target length, times the spring constant of the rubber band. Okay, so why don't people take a few minutes to get their CompuCell working again and uh, get back to where we were last time and uh, get that up again. That was uh, 
in the homework that was officially due today, that was homework problem 4.1. Uh, we also did it in class last week. So I'll let people take a few minutes to uh, to get that running. And why don't, since it's 6.30, I'll tell you what, why don't we do a 10 minute break? Uh, but that break includes the exercise. So so I will say that at, at uh, 6.30, it's 26, 25, 635, we'll come back. Um, if you have it running already, that's fine. Uh, if not, uh, you can take a break. If not, um, take a short break and then use the break time to uh, to get that working. Juliana, if you can ask answer questions, if anybody has questions or needs to help remembering where they are, but it's gonna be critical for everybody to have that working because all of the exercises we're going to do for the rest of the lecture will be based on that, okay? Any questions about that before we, before we do our break? The next step of this project, and again, it's, it was from the homework, would be to create a loop in the Python steppables that changes the target volume and target surface area uh, that increases the target volume. And here it says by five every 10 Monte Carlo steps. That's actually pretty fast. Um, and again, you should be plotting the pressure and the membrane tension as a function of time. And what you'll see is that if you have a single cell to begin with, and you don't change the target volume of surface, the pressure will initially change a little bit, and then it will stabilize. If you are continually changing the target volume and target surface, uh, then you will see that there will be uh, changes in the pressure and the surface tension uh, that will happen continually. Does anybody want to tell me what they got uh, when you did this exercise? Shall I call on somebody or... Let's see. So, but I could I could go just to make sure okay. I'm actually doing it right. Okay, sure. <laughs> All right. So should I share my screen? Why not? All right, cool. Uh, should I share my here? I'll share my Twitter first. I guess, or maybe the what am I doing here? Let's do this. Um. So is this the right way to go about it? Yeah, that looks good to me. This is wrong because that's just from something from the homework, but uh, and this is too. This is, but uh, yeah, basic idea, and then surface tension. You can do the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then here, then I'll I could just share the simulation then. Right. You've Sorry, already I, done. I, You've already done the next step of the exercise, which is to put build the tracking field. So, so uh, you've already got that there, but we'll go over that now in, in class once we get through this. So let's take a look at what you got when you ran it. Yes. Here, sorry, I'm going to have to, since I, I'm running this on my Mac, my new Mac, but I got it to work like really janky. So it, <laughs> I've got to share the entire on my other screen here. So I'm just setting that up. Let's okay. see. All right. You see all these windows? Yep. All right, cool. Uh so yeah, here I'll run it. So they're set to double their volume or their target volume every five hundred Monte Carlo steps. And you can see when they do the cell division, the pressure glitches, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it spikes down. Yeah. And within within the normal, when they're not dividing, there's some fluctuations in pressure and surface tension, but they're not enormous. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, here, I think I could just do this. Yeah, but since it doesn't go above zero, or whoops, since it doesn't go above zero, it doesn't really show anything. It's just blue. So, so one thing, one thing you have to do if we haven't talked about tracking fields yet, but tracking mm -hmm. fields in principle should handle negative values, but in fact have trouble with them. Um, so if you if you make if you make the pressure, um, depending on how how the pressure is working for you, if you look at the pressure. Uh, in your plot of the pressure, you'll see it's always negative. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the direction the direction that pressure is defined is a little bit backwards compared to what you expect. And so, if you if in the dictionary you put pressure equals minus cell dot pressure, then then the tracking field would work. Okay, so pressure equals. So where you set the, the dictionary entry for pressure oh. equal to just yeah, put a yeah. minus sign in front of it. Or yeah, right. absolute value. And, that way you right. never have any problem. Right. right. Hmm. Actually, if you go back to your Twitter, we could probably find that pretty fast. Yeah, so I saw you doing that mistake and I kept quiet. When you removed stuff from a loop, you made a loop with nothing in it. Right Where there on the... Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep, sorry. <laughs> there we go. All right, now I should be able to do this. There you go. Nice. Cool. All right. Anybody else have something they want to show or talk about? Did that, did you get something similar? Uh, Gabriel, you've jumped ahead a little bit in the sense that you've already got the cells dividing, which I had, which I was going to do a little bit later, but this is fine. It's a yeah, sorry. This is just an excuse for me to do my homework. So. No, no, that's fine. The whole point of this was to get everybody through the homework exercise. So if you're a few steps ahead, that's just fine. Anybody have a question or comment so far? Or people more or less up? Is this making sense for people? Please don't be shy about asking questions or, or asking for help. My um, looks, uh, question. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, my looks. Thank you. Uh, mine looks a little different from Gabrielle's. Can I share on this screen? Yeah, sure. here, I'll, uh, I'll unshare right now. Right. There you go. All right. And I should apologize to everybody if you wanted to go to the basketball game tonight. Oh, what game is it? Rutgers. Huh. Which, which I would not normally know. And, and I'll tell somebody, if people are interested, I can tell you offline why I know this. But in any case, uh, uh, it, it was actually, I mean, we're, we're, meeting, we're meeting virtually because I wasn't feeling well. But in fact, this would have been a good night not to have to go in person to Luddy because the, 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 base, the basketball game had an early start. And so getting to and from Luddy would have been a nightmare today. That's why the buses were especially off. Because the game started at, at 5 or 5.30, I think. And so so the, they had all the streets blocked off. And it'll end at seven at 8 o'clock. So, uh, so, so as it happens, it would not have been the easiest day to get back and forth to, to the university. Okay, so go ahead, please. So can you see my screen? So this is basically uh, number 1A, the homework. Um, you want to hit run yeah. and so we can see what happens as, the, as it.
So you have a single cell, you're increasing mm -hmm. the target volume. Now, are you increasing the target surface as well or just the target volume? Um, yeah, both uh, target volume and target surface. Well, so that's the initial that's the initial value of target volume and target surface. But in the step function, okay, let's look at the step function together. Okay. In the growth stepable, let's see. Let's look at the step function, the step next part of this. So the start is where you initialize things. The step is how you update things. And in the step function, you are increasing the target volume in line 30, in line 67 but you're not increasing the target surface. Oh, yeah. And so this would correspond to a balloon uh -huh. where you're blowing more and more air into the balloon. But the more air you blow into the balloon, uh -huh. the more tension the surface is under. Biologically, uh -huh. it would correspond to increasing the hydrostatic pressure of the cell without increasing the amount of membrane in the cell. And so what you're going to see is that the volume will keep going up, but the membrane will get more and more stretched. And because of the way CompuCell works on a lattice, that will mean that the cell, instead of becoming round, which is what would happen uh, in hydropathy, hydro, uh, hydro, uh, hydropic swelling in, in a vertebrate cell, uh, what will happen is the cell will become square uh, for the reasons that we talked about in previous classes. Uh, so uh, the pressure will go up and mm -hmm. the uh, and the uh, cell will get rigid because you're it's like again like a balloon you're pu putting more and more material into the balloon but the membrane around the balloon isn't growing and actually that's exactly what the point of this exercise is and so that's a great way to illustrate that so i appreciate that um, but everything you're doing here seems quite quite reasonable and I think the results that you're seeing, the volume goes up, the pressure goes up, the surface tension goes up, and the cell gets square, are all what you would expect if you keep increasing the target volume without concomitantly increasing the target surface. Okay. Um, and, and one more quick question is, uh, where can I um, adjust the MCS? Like, you can, in the slides. You adjusted MCS. I'm sorry, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I caught that. Please say that. So, again. like, like, like the Monte Carlo step can be um, changed, like MCS divided by ten, like that. Um, what What do you want to do with it? You mean for display purposes or for for actually the simulation? Uh, in that way, can I not uh, change the speed of the display? Oh, okay. So for the display, so 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 one thing you cannot do is change MCS. They uh -huh. themselves are a property of the simulation. It's like doing an experiment and saying, how do I change the time in the experiment? Time comes from the universe. You can't change the time. Uh -huh. You can wait. You could you could measure things at different frequencies, but you the, the we can't take time backwards or make time go slower. And so in the CompuCell as well, MCS is a is a heartbeat that you're stuck with. On the other hand, if you want to plot things, um, let's go to the 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 step function. So scroll down in your step function, uh, and suppose that you want to add your data point every ten Monte Carlo steps instead of every Monte Carlo step. Um, after line 70, before line 70, you could use the syntax, uh, probably 68 and, and 69, you can do every Monte Carlo step. But if you want to plot them every 10 Monte Carlo steps, the syntax is a little un, unintuitive. It's if not, if not, parenthesis, MCS, 
percent, which is the modulo function, and then whatever interval you want, 10, 10 15, 50, and then colon. No, after the close parenthesis, colon. And then you have to indent the block of code that you want to run every 10 microcodes. So if you select, um, yeah, that, well, that you probably don't want, well, that's a question. Do you want this to be inside your loop or not? Um, so if you do well, what you've got here, you will only display this for one cell. Uh -huh. If you want to display it for every cell, then you have to indent. So, so can somebody else help 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 uh, uh, JH out a little bit here? What what does what do, what does JH need to do here? Python people. So what were you what are you trying to do every 10 Monte Carlo steps again? Sorry, I got lost. So I think I saw something about this in the slide. So that's that's why I was gonna try something about Monte Carlo stuff. And I thought that change would display the graph like uh, the speed of the graph slowly or faster. Yeah, so I, I like instead of doing every Monte Carlo step to uh, on my plot, I I had it plot every a hundred Monte Carlo steps what the values were. So if you were trying to do it every ten, you can highlight like you know you might want to move like your what you're calling for your dictionary away from um your if your if not loop. But if you highlight the like self plot when one two and three and you click like you see the little green arrow in the top taskbar that's an indent function mm -hmm. so if you go all the way up above your save you see something with a green arrow and some lines right next to the scissors yeah that's if fine. you highlight what everything you want in that loop you can move it all over and then it should fall under that loop for you so then every 10 monte carlo steps it will add new points to pressure volume and surface so should I do like this or this? So you, you know, so go ahead and move the if not to just above self dot plot win one. Now highlight self dot plot win one, two, and three. Um. And then hit the green arrow button. And now it should update every 10 Monte Carlo steps. Gotcha. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Again, if you're not used to Python block indentation for loops, it's just, it, we have, it's one of the things you have to get used to. The, anything after the colon creates a block and everything that's indented the same way after a colon, whether the colon is in an if statement or a loop, uh, is executed together. And so that's uh, that's something that's very Pythonic and, and takes a little bit of getting used to. So that should that now that should update your plots every 10 Monte Carlo steps. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, Carmen, did you have a question? Yeah, I did, but I got answered. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Thank you very much for being willing to help each other out. I think it's it's good to be able to do that. Okay, so uh, I think everybody's got this working more or less. Uh, slightly different versions, that's okay. Um, and so again, the pressure in the cell is is minus two times lambda volume. This comes back to to uh, Elmer's comment about what does that lambda mean. So that really converts, it converts volume to pressure or uh, surface area to surface tension. And it's basically the rigidity of the material. Okay. And this is how I did it. And here I had the target volume go up and I did not have the, uh, the surface area go up, the target surface go up. 
Um, something else is, uh, depending on what you're trying to do, it might make sense for the target volume to increase by a constant amount per unit time. Uh, it might also make sense for the target volume to increase exponentially. So you mul multiply by 1.001 or something like that, in which case you'd have slow exponential growth. So those are both possible. Uh, in both cases here, I've said equals target volume plus five. Of course, to be Pythonic, I would use plus equals five or times equals five, 1.2, instead of putting the, the name on both sides. Okay. So now I want to come to something that, that Gabriel just showed us, but I want to emphasize, uh, which is quite useful, which is the idea of a tracking field. And uh, initially, Compucell didn't have these, and people complained bitterly about it. And so one of the things that really is very nice in CompuCell is that if you want to give, and you can have vector tracking fields too, which work. Uh, if you want to look at a value inside of a cell, and of course, if you do it by experimental biology, you're used to doing things like in situ hybridization or immunostaining to say how much of a messenger RNA do I have in each cell or how much protein do I have in each cell of a particular kind. Um, in the same way, you might want to say each cell has some value associated with it and you want to label the cell in its display with that value. And so tracking fields could do that. Again, you can have a vector, which will draw an arrow uh, or uh, a scalar value, which will give a color. And the way you do that is in, we rarely play with the init function. We normally are inside start or step or finish. Now this is one of the few times that you need to be inside the init. Um, and there is extra fields automatic tracking, track scalar attribute, and it tells you that it goes in the init. So that's something to remember. So it does give you a hint. The key thing is that it has to go after that steppable base dot pi dot init. If you put it before, it will crash. And the command is self track le cell level scalar attribute. Field name is the display name that you'll use to reference that field. An attribute name is going to be the name of some key that you will have in the cell dictionary. So you have to remember what that is. Often we will make the field name and the attribute name the same, but they could be the same or different. Uh, they're doing different things and it won't confuse them. Now, one thing that CompuCell will not do is that the cell intrinsically has an attribute of pressure. And if I want to display the pressure in each cell, I can't say, give me a scalar uh, tracking field of cell dot pressure. I have to copy cell dot pressure into a dictionary entry named pressure to do it. And so in this case, to create a tracking field here that shows the pressure in each cell, I would create cell dot dict quote pressure equals cell dot pressure, or as Gabriel pointed out, minus cell dot pressure, okay? And so this is quite powerful. Once you've created that initial tracking attribute field and created the dictionary entry, remember you have to remember to update the dictionary entries in the step function, you'll get a display of the values. Um, Something that is nice about CompuCell, which is not always forgiving of this, is that if some cells have that dictionary entry and some don't, CompuCell will not fail. Uh, if the dictionary entry is missing, the field will just be shown as zero in that cell. It doesn't fail. A lot of other times, if there's something expected to be referenced, Python will, 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 will gronk, but not here. So now I'd like you to do exactly that. Uh, create a tracking field. 
named pressure, and you can create one called tension as well. Give the attribute name pressure and tension for each one. And then in the step function, copy cell.dict pressure equals, and here I have cell.pressure, but actually you probably want to be minus cell.pressure, given what Gabriel saw. And the same thing, cell.dict tension equals cell that minus cell dot tension. It's actually surface tension, right? Juliana? If you don't remember, you can use the twitted attri cell attributes to look up what the, what the reference is, okay? So why don't people try that? Some people already have it from the homework, but if you don't have it already, uh, please add those features for the pressure and the surface tension. Uh, Gabriel had the pressure, but not the surface tension. So we can add that. Is it clear for everybody what we need here? So again, what you'll do is you'll go to the init. In the init, after you've got the loading of the base class, you'll add self dot track scalar cell level attribute, et cetera. Uh, you'll replace field name with pressure, attribute name with pressure, field name with tension or surface tension, attribute name tension or surface tension. So that's adding one, two lines in the init. And then in your, in your step function, when you loop over cells, you'll add cell.dict, the name here, pressure, has to correspond to whatever you used as attribute name here, equals cell dot pressure. And again, you probably need a minus sign. And the same thing, cell dot dict tension. And you'll have to look up what the surface tension is in that directory of cell attributes. So for people who've got it working, as a little bit of a stretch exercise, while we're making sure everybody's got this working, uh, one of the things you can do is in the player settings, it can be interesting to go into the configuration menu, select the field settings for the tracking field. And you may want to have the top and bottom values be float, be auto scaled, uh, in which case, uh, the color values will be scale change every every time step and based on the minimum maximum values. Uh, but sometimes you want to keep the color values the same, so that if it was red at some early time, red means the same thing at a later time. So you might play a little bit with the player settings for those fields uh, to explore the best way to display them uh, while everybody is working on on getting. The basics work. And Dr. Glacier? Please I, go ahead. I was the one who asked earlier about the print statements for the local install. Could you walk me through really quick how to how to see those again? So so if you've just done a print and you're on a local install, uh, when you launch CompuCell or Twit it, it will pop up a Python window, a text window which will put a lot of junk on, which will display a lot of junk about loading various step of uh, plugins and other things related to the um, configuration of the software. Uh, that window will be the place where, where um, your print output is displayed. And I will show you in about five minutes how to display it within player. That that that's a slightly different exercise, and we'll, we'll I'll show you that how to redirect that print that that print output to player. Gotcha. Thank you, um, Giuliano. Do you have do you have Twit Twit CompuCell running locally on your computer at the moment? I don't have it up. I just need to open it. Shouldn't take too long. Just the way the way I have things configured at the moment. Uh, for the Zoom, I don't have it set up lo local. And unfortunately, on NanoHub, you can't see print output. 
So, so that that's a that's a disadvantage in that. But the output is external to player. It's in the it's in the Python console window, uh, which means that the the, the prints tend, can get lost in the in the in all of the diagnostics that are printed automatically when Contrasol runs. Okay, does anybody, does everybody have this working? Does anybody having trouble with it? If you're having trouble with it at this point, speak up and we'll see what we could do to help out. Everybody okay on that? Okay, so uh, Nick, Nick beat me to this. Um, something that I'd wanted for a long time that was implemented last year in CompuCell was the ability to uh, create uh, message windows uh, in player. Uh, just the way we create a graphics output window, you can create a text output window within player. Um, one thing though, is that the syntax is not in uh, Twitter yet, it's too new. Um, there is a demo uh, in the CompuCell install, which will uh, show you how to do this. Uh, but the command is add new message window. Add underscore new underscore message underscore window parenthesis title. And just as with plot windows, every window has to have a new title. So you can't have a window called messages and another window called messages. Uh, you can have multiple message windows, although in my experience, if you have too many of them, they can cause a crash. I'm not sure why. Um, I haven't sorry. used it enough to figure that one out. I can show the print thingy if you want. Okay, let's do that. Let's first see the default print to the console, and then we'll do this little exercise. Okay, so I have a simulation opened here, which you should be seeing now. I have a bunch of cells, and this is the terminal window that we were talking about. The black box that comes with CompuCell and prints a bunch of stuff when you initialize CompuCell. So now if I hit play, and oops, my bad. There's the play. Now, why did it get stuck? I don't know, but. It's your scrolling, the scroll to the end. No, uh, CompuCell got stuck. Okay. That may be a, that may be, you think that's a Zoom issue? Maybe yeah. CompuCell stopped to stopped responding, so I guess it's Zoom. Anyway. Okay. But if I stop CompuCell there. That's the console. Let's see what happens if I hit play now. Nothing. Oh, there we go. Yeah, there it is. That's okay now. Again, it would be nice if you could redirect that output to the console window in player. And as uh, I say, there, there's a settings button in in player that oh, says redirect yeah. and it doesn't work. Yep. So that's a that's a bug. And unfortunately, it's a bug that seems to be hard to fix. So, um, if you are running on NanoHub, you're stuck because you can't you can't visualize the the console. The console is hidden. So that that's an unfortunate unfortunate nano hub annoyance. So let's come back to this 
this command here, and I'd like everybody to try it out. In the start function, type, um, again, self.message underscore window is a handle. You could call it self.myWindow or something else. The name here doesn't matter. But the function add new message window will pop up a window that looks like this that will be labeled. Here I called it messages. It will be labeled messages. I can then use in my step function or elsewhere self.message window using the handle dot print. And I can print the way I would print to console. Quote inside start function. I can define a color. I can define style, bold, italic, underline, and so on. And if I want to clear this message window, there's self.messageWindow.clear, which will erase the contents of the window. Okay. So try, and again, if you're on NanoHub, this isn't implemented yet, but if you're on any local install, Try this, uh, display the step number and number of cells in the simulation every 10 Monte Carlo steps. So again, add in the start function, self.message window. It's a little bit verbose, but not hard to remember. Add new message window, title, messages. In the step function, self.message window dot print and then you have to figure out what to put in so that every 10 Monte Carlo steps, you plot um, the number, step number, so the number of Monte Carlo steps and the number of cells. Okay. And again, if you're a little faster, uh, you can try exploring things like erasing the messages or creating multiple uh, windows to do a display. And for the people who are on NanoHub, I apologize that this isn't implemented. And if people find a crash, because this is a new feature, if you find that it crashes in some interesting way, please do a screenshot of it in the code so that we can uh, let uh, Machek and TJ know that there's an issue. Um, no, I just wanted to let you know that every time I try to run with the message window that CompuCell crashes out. Hmm. You're on a Mac or a PC? I'm, I'm running it on a PC. Huh. How does it crash? It doesn't give me any errors. It literally just closes CompuCell out. And le it leaves Twitter open, but CompuCell closes out. Hmm. And, uh, and you're creating this in the, in the, in the start function. And yeah, you're writing to it in the yeah. In so the let's take a look. It's possible. I mean, I I tried this out earlier today, and it worked on my install on a PC. But that doesn't mean it's going to work for everybody. So it's 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 a new feature. So it's certainly possible that it's got a bug. So let's okay. see what let's see let's why don't you screen share and we'll see what happens. Yeah, I'm, it's actually on my work computer, so it's not on the one I'm on Zoom on right now. But ah, okay. I don't know if you can see the Twitter file. So in the I'm in the growth steppable with that effect. Okay, so one thing that is important is that you have to create the window yeah, and okay. print to it in the same steppable. So if you if you do if you if you create if you put the Create if you create the window mm -hmm. in this in the start function for one one steppable, yep. and then try to reference it in another steppable, that will crash. Yeah, it's in the so I'm establishing it in the start function of the growth steppable, and then the step function of the same steppable. I'm trying to have a print a message every ten MCS. Hmm. Well, that should work. When I did it, it worked. It, I can show you exactly what happens when I click run. Unfortunately, it's blurring it out. I don't know why it's not. Uh, it, you're, you're, it looks oh. like Zoom that's intentionally protecting your privacy because you look completely clear, but when you point at the screen, it's blurring it. Does that help? That's there we go. Yeah, that's all right. 
So when I click run, it'll load everything up and then close it out. Yeah, and of course that's a, that's a particularly unpleasant kind of failure because then you don't have the console to see what the error was. Mm -hmm. Well, except if Twit if Twit is still open, then the then the Python console should still be there. Nope, it closes the Python console for me as well. Oh, what's the version? What you're running the latest version of CompuCell? Um, I as far as I'm aware, yes. Okay. What about other people? Are other people having the same problem? Anybody, Carmen or? Mine, uh, mine is letting me print, but if I try to clear it before every print, then it I have a similar, a similar drop, but only when I'm trying to clear it. Okay. I think there may be an issue where if you try to clear before you have anything in the window, that may cause a problem. Ah, that, that may be it. Uh, it shouldn't. I mean, it's the, 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 the clear function should work, but, but that's possible. Because I was having a funny thing where, where if I only had one print window, it worked fine. But if I created two of them and printed to it, uh, it would there was some kind of look like a buffer overflow where where it would fail after a thousand print statements um so it's possible that this is i mean this is is still buggy i guess um the only thing i can say is that if you please if you use it and you can document the bugs then we can figure out what's going on i suspect it's that this issue about the clear function failing my guess is that um, it's not checking to see when it, the probably it's the clear is assuming that there is something in the window to clear. Um, so it works without the clear function, but it doesn't work when you're using the clear. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Anybody else? What's your experience? Um, so mine, I get an error. It says that there is no attribute for adding a new message window okay so are you on nano hub or are you running locally running locally okay that's interesting well, so, but weren't you using a, an older version yeah i didn't okay. update. okay so that's the problem this is a new feature okay so it's only it's only available in the latest release or two of CompuCell. Uh, and, and as I say, I, I was torn about it because it's not in the NanoHub version and it's not, it's not in the older versions of CompuCell, but, pe but people found it so convenient that I wanted to at least show it to the people who had it. And, uh, I'm, I'm always a little bit reluctant to do anything that's specific to a particular version, but I did want to show people uh, and I also want people to try it out so that if there were bugs, we'd catch them. So people who've got it working and have bugs, those reports would be very valuable. Anybody else having this experience? Maybe a, a show of hands. How many people does it work for, if anybody? Uh oh, that doesn't look good. Nick, it works. I don't know if this would affect it, but I, I downloaded the new version today. Now the newest version should be should it should work. Now these crashes with things like uh, clearing may may still be there because people haven't played with it that much. So okay. you can always you can always you can still print to the console the the, the global console. Uh, this is more a feature that. Again, if we can get the new, newest version of CompuCell up on NanoHub, this will be really nice for a user interface. So um, the next, sorry, go ahead. I have a question. Uh, mine is showing the, the step in the window, but how do you code uh, to show the step at every 10 MCS instead of every MCS? So you'd use the same command that we used before, if not oh, the percent colon. Gotcha. Thank you. 
So why don't you take a minute and try that out and see if it works. It works. Thank you. Great. Anybody else? As I say, it seems like an obvious thing to be able to display text in, in inside a player, but it, it, it's been a bit of a struggle to get. So the other thing I wanted to talk about today was some more graphics, plotting, which is histograms. And so we've we've learned how to plot time series or point plot, scatter plots or line plots, uh, but when we're doing statistical analysis, it's nice to be able to do a histogram. And CompuCell does support histograms. Um, they're not that complicated to do, uh, but they do take a few more steps than doing a regular plot because you have to do a couple of different things. A histogram is a plot of the frequency of occurrence of something. And so fundamentally, you build histograms from lists. And so instead of passing to the plot utility uh, an x comma y coordinate, you will pass to the plot utility a list. And that list will be a series of scalar elements, uh, floating point elements typically. Uh, and then it will the, the, the histogram will, will do the plot of the histogram for you. And uh, we're, we're going to do, in our case, if, you, if your simulation only has one cell, uh, maybe you want to make the cell divide. We can come back to that. But we'll, we'll do it for assuming we have multiple cells. If you only have one cell, the histogram is going to be pretty boring. But when we add cell division, it will be more interesting. And one thing I should say is save this simulation that you have today so that next week we have it to work with. So make sure that you have it because we'll build on it. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to add a histogram of the pressure to our cells, of our cells. And I'll walk you through the steps and then I'll give you a little assignment. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go through that uh, Twitit a Python uh, pull down menu. And one of our options is called scientific plots, histograms. And we're going to select add histogram plot. And it tells us that this has to be in the start function. Just the way to configure a plot for uh, a regular time series, we do that in the start. And it's going to paste in a bunch of text, um, some of which will look very familiar. Um, it will say add new plot window, which is not any different from what we're used to. Uh, we were adding new plot windows for uh, our time series. And here we're gonna call it histogram of cell volumes in this case, uh, x-axis title, x-axis would be uh, the variable, which we're going to do the histogram over, and the y-axis would be the frequency. And then we're going to add, instead of adding a regular time series to the, to the plot, to the window, we're going to add a histogram plot. And what we need is to give it a name, a color, and uh, what alpha means we'll come back to in a little bit. You're going to have to make sure that the handle on the plot window has a different name from the one that we used for the time series plots. So if we used plot window already, we could call it hist plot or plot win three or something else, but you have to be make sure that the plot windows are given unique handles. And in our case, we're going to make the x-axis be pressure. 
and the y-axis be frequency. And we only need one histogram, so we'll get rid of these two extra histogram lines that we're not going to use. Okay. Then in our step function, we have to do two things. We have to create a list of scalar values that we're going to do the histogram for. And then we have to actually histogram that value, those that list. And so in the step function, we're first going to create an empty list. Here I'll call it pressure list. And to create an empty list, we say square brackets like that. And then we're going to loop over our cells. And we're going to append the cell's pressure to the list. And to remind you, if you're doing Python, you use the append function. So here we called the list pressure list, pressure list dot append, and cell dot pressure. And probably I should have a minus sign in front of it because of the pressure being defined as negative. So in the in the step function, I'll do pressure list equals blank for cell and self got cell list colon pressure list append cell dot pressure. And so now I've created a list that contains the pressure in all the cells. If I only have one cell, there'll only be one element in the list. Now, in the step function, I'm going to go in, and now that won't be inside of the loop. And I will say, add histogram step function. And I'll say self.plotwin add histogram. I'll have to change the handle from plotwin to whatever I called that window. Plot name. This plot name has to agree with the one I used in the start function. And then value array. And that's the name of the list, whatever it was. And then the number of bins. If I want my histogram to have 10 bins, I say 10. If I want 50 bins, I say 50. And the one thing that you also may want to do at some point uh, would be to erase the image uh, so that your histogram updates dynamic. Okay. So now I'd like you to try that. And here's what the results should look like when you do this. This is assuming you have a lot of cells. If you only have one cell, you'll just get one bump in the middle. But I'd like you to try this on your own. So add to your start function a new window where you put your histogram, a histogram plot for the pressure. And then in the step function, create a list of the pressures of all the cells. It's okay if there's only one cell, it won't be very interesting, but it'll work. And then create that list and then plot it. And everything that you need to do this is in those scientific plot histograms, put it function. So why don't you take a few minutes to try that out? If people have questions about how to do it, please ask. And I'll give you a few minutes to try that out. When you've got it working, you can give me a thumbs up. As a stretch exercise, if you get it done before other people in the class, uh, you could try changing the number of bins in the histogram. And you also have the ability by right-clicking on the histogram to change its properties a bit. So you might want to explore those options. While people are working on this, let me just show you. I didn't create the full simulation, but I'll just walk you through the steps to add the histogram. So, in this simulation, I have growth steppable here. In the start function, uh, there's a problem, which is a growth steppable by default doesn't have a start function. So I'll add a start function to it. And my indentation is off. Add a start function to it. 
And then in the growth steppable, I will go to CC3D Python, scientific plots histogram, add histogram plot. And here I get more stuff than I need. Self.plotwin, I will call it histwin because it has to be separate from the other plots that I have. I will say histogram of pressure. X-axis would be pressure. Y-axis would be frequency. I only need one of these, so I get rid of two. And alpha here is actually the transparency because if you overlay histograms, you need to be able to see through things. And I need to change plot width to hist width here. Like that. And then in my step function, I have to create an empty list for by plot or by hist for by pressure. So I'll say pressures equals square bracket empty list. Inside my loop, I'm going to do pressure dot append. minus cell dot pressure, which will make a list of all the values. And now outside of that loop, I need to go back, CC3D Python, scientific plots, add histogram. have to get them outside of the loop. I only need one of them. Plot win has to be changed back to hist win. Plot name here has to match the plot name here. The value array is now going to be pressure. Okay. So that's what the steps are to do that. Did that did that help with people? I know we're running out of time, so I want to make sure that everybody saw that. Does anybody have it working and want to show it? Yeah, I can show. Okay, please take it away. Okay, that's great. So in this case, I think you're actually, you didn't change the name of the plot, so it says cell volumes, but it's actually plotting the pressures. And you'll see that the pressures are negative, which is fine. Did anybody else get something similar? Anybody stuck? I hope that I hope that 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 worked for people. So you get something like this. And as you'll notice, each time you redo it, it plots a new histogram. So you'll see a dynamically updating histogram. Something again that only will work on your desktop, but they can be quite convenient, is that if you go over a plot, 
and you right click over it, it'll give you a variety of options, some of which work and not all of which work. Uh, you could adjust the x-axis scale, the y-axis scale. Um, and if you hit export, uh, it will allow you to save the current screenshot in the form of an image or uh, a comma-separated list. So if you wanted to actually export this for something that you would import into Excel or to Google, slot, Google Sheets, uh, you could do that. Unfortunately, this doesn't work uh, because of the privileging. It doesn't work on the NanoHub, but it does work locally. This also will work for a time series plot, not only for the histograms, but it's particularly useful for histograms. So that's something to remember. Um, you could export the image of the plot. You could copy it into a clipboard. Um, and so you have quite a few options for saving the data. Of course, you could open files within, within uh, the Python, which is really a more correct thing to do computationally. But if you're playing and learning how to work the simulation uh, and you haven't decided exactly what you want to save, being able to grab those data sets and save them by hand is quite useful. And so I, I encourage you to play with that. Again, all, that will not work on the NanoHub deployment. As we've known from before, uh, print statements don't work in the CompuCell NanoHub. Uh, so the best thing that you could do in that case is to open files and save to files in NanoHub which is not very convenient, but it's the best we're going to get to do. All right. So I don't think we'll have time today to go over contact energy and neighbor order. That's a sort of a technical point, but it's something that, that can be a source of um, some confusion. And I wanted to go over that. Uh, in previous semesters, as I mentioned, we had a homework assignment on that. Uh, it was a relatively time consuming homework assignment. And so, uh, in the attempt to reduce the homework effort, uh, we, we didn't assign it this year. Uh, I will go over that next time in, in class. Are there any other comments or questions before we break for tonight? I know people uh, are probably hungry and tired, so I don't want to keep you longer than we need to. Yeah, uh, just one about the homework. Um, so the last questions three and four, are more to do with both this and cell sorting. Should we wait for next week's class or should we just go? I mean, three is possibly doable because it's uh, more, it's it's mostly just dealing with uh, like linear dependence and stuff with cell pressure, but four seems like something more related to stuff we're gonna do later on. So I'm not sure, is that something that you'd want us to try to do anyway, or? So, so I, I'll, I'll repeat what I said before, and I'm not saying it because I'm telling you that you shouldn't ask the question, but just because I want to emphasize this, which is um, sometimes the homework assignments are assigned before we do the class. And so, in fact, they're almost always assigned before we do the class. So we don't know how far we're going to get. Um, and occasionally the homework assignments are to, have you think about something and try it out so that when we cover it in class, it's familiar. But anytime there is a homework assignment that uses material, like the homework assignment that asks you to use tracking fields for the pressure, where we hadn't talked about tracking fields, uh, it's completely up to you to decide, do you want to hold it for a week until we've talked about it in class or do you want to try it out? And if you try it out, and it's, it doesn't come work out. And then we cover it in class. You say, oh, now I know how to do it. And you want to upload a new version of the homework with the improved, with the improved results. We're quite happy to grade the improved results. Uh, so, so in this case, I would definitely uh, hold the, hold the self-sorting until we talk about it. Um, and if people, uh, we're not going to have much homework aside this week, if any. 
because so much of the homework from last week was 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 uh, things that we didn't get to yet. And so uh, you should not feel shy about saying, saying, hey, we didn't cover this in class. Um, and the answer almost always will be, that's okay, wait, if you want. Um, if you're concerned about it, uh, please just email us when you're working on the homework, especially if you do it. Most people, I mean, some people start the homework the day we assign it, but most people don't do it till the weekend. A lot of people probably don't do it till the night before it's due, which is a little more problematic. But suppose we assigned the homework on a Tuesday, uh, Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, you try the homework, and you discover, uh-oh, there's all this stuff in it that I don't know how to do. You look at the manuals and you say, boy, this is confusing. You email me or Giuliano and we'll tell you, if it's confusing, wait. Uh, you don't have to be licensed by us. In other words, you could simply say, uh, I, uh, I needed to see it in class before I could do it. Uh, but it never hurts to give it a shot, look at the manuals and try it. Uh, but do do that you know, to the point where it's it's a learning exercise for you, not to the point where it's frustrating. Is that, is that a reasonable answer to that? Absolutely. Uh, I yeah. don't want people to be frustrated. On the other hand, Sometimes trying it on your own isn't a bad thing. And so you have to decide what your tolerance for, for exploring, right, flying blind is. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we're never going to penalize you for, for our being late in presenting the material in class. And I just want to reiterate that, that, that the purpose of the homework is to help you consolidate what we do in class and different people learn in different ways. And so whatever is most useful to you is what we want. Juliana, I don't know if you want to say anything to that, but I, I think. Are there any other comments or questions before we break for tonight? I want to thank everybody for the great presentations. Um, there were more presentations that more detailed than I expected, which is why we didn't get through quite as much of the lecture as I thought, which is, but that's fine. I, I do, I do appreciate that. Uh, we material wise for the course, uh, we need to get through uh, the mitosis stepable. How do you control cell division, which is something that's critical. Um, it's templated in automatically when we click the mitosis steppable, but the mitosis steppable doesn't always do exactly what we want. And so we have to learn how to modify that to do the things that we're interested in. Uh, cell sorting is a very old simulation. It was the first simulation, the first simulation, 30 years, some years ago now. Uh, uh, and so uh, that has its own interest. It's very simple, but has its own interest. Um, and that'll introduce the idea of iterating over cell neighbors, which is an important concept. And then the next thing that we're going to have to do is in, introduce the idea of chemical fields and diffusion. Uh, and then after that, uh, everything is in a sense advanced topics. Uh, we'll have how do cells interact with fields by secretion, absorption, and chemotaxis, that is movement of the cell in response to chemical fields. And then uh, when we're done with that, there are really only three topics left, some of which we may cover or not, some of which you may need for the class or may not. One of which is, how do we make cells that aren't just single blobs, but have compartments in them? One of which is, how do we build rigid mechanical structures using what are called links? And the last one is, how do we couple uh, molecular networks to cell behaviors. And then when you have those things implemented, you have essentially everything that you really need to build even the most complicated simulation. So it's going to take us a while to get through all of that, but those are sort of looking ahead to the things that we need. Okay, I want to thank everybody for your patience this week. I hope to be able to be in person next week for the people who are going to be uh, who like that. 
The week after next, the 20th, week of the 20th, I'm going to be away and Giuliano will be lecturing uh, and he will be talking about uh, some of the material that regular material and also specifically talking about how you create uh, GitHub repositories, uh, how you upload uh, to NanoHub, uh, maybe a little bit about running on clusters and, and parameter scans. Uh, and uh, if he has time, maybe he can demo some of his beautiful uh, viral simulations for you as well. All right. I want to thank you all. And uh, as always, I appreciate your patience. Uh, if people want to report that bug uh, that they found in the, in the, in the print window, uh, that would be great. And we can try to debug that and see if it's, if it's a CompuCell bug or if it's an issue with the syntax, uh, we'll be happy to work on that. And otherwise, I will see you next week or uh, when I hear from you individually to make appointments. Good night.